I'm Scott Hervey from Weintraub Tobin. The Copyright Office has recently announced a handful of new exemptions to the anti-circumvention section of the DMCA, one of which may be extremely beneficial to purchasers of consumer and business devices. That's the subject for today's installment of The Briefing by the IP Law Blog. In 1998, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was signed into law by President Bill Clinton. The act included a section that has become commonly referred to as the anti-circumvention provision. This section makes it unlawful to circumvent technological measures used to prevent unauthorized access to copyrighted works. For example, this section would prohibit getting around DVD encryption. It would also establish a rulemaking proceeding to determine whether the prohibition on circumvention is having or is likely to have an adverse effect on a user's ability to make non-infringing uses of particular classes of copyrighted works. Every three years, the Registrar of Copyrights holds hearings on proposed new exemptions to the anti-circumvention provision. The Copyright Office just recently concluded the eighth triennial rulemaking proceeding. Scott, what new exemptions arose? Well, the registrar renewed a number of existing exemptions and also approved a handful of new exemptions. One group of petitioners sought to expand a current exemption that permits circumvention of encryption controls protecting DVD, Blu-rays, and the like for the purpose of criticism and comment, including for educational purposes by certain users. The registrar found the petition compelling and recommended expanding the exemption to permit employees of colleges and universities, when directed by a faculty member for the purpose of course teaching, to circumvent the encryption controls protecting DVDs and Blu-rays. Basically, the intent is to allow a professor to rip clips from a DVD for the purpose of in-class teaching. The registrar also approved a similar use by accredited nonprofit educational institutions for the purposes of offering massive open online courses. Another exemption approved by the registrar permits certain institutions, such as libraries and universities, to circumvent the encryption controls on DVDs and Blu-rays of motion pictures and television shows that are no longer generally available in the marketplace and, well, for the purpose of making replacement copies of discs that are damaged or deteriorating or at a risk of doing so. These seem to be well-needed exemptions for libraries and universities, but did the registrar rule on any proposed exemptions that would have a positive impact on the general public for, say, a common problem, Scott? As a matter of fact, that did happen. So, Josh, how common is it for your very expensive computer technology device or smartphone to break, maybe from an accidental dropping? More common than I'm going to tell our listeners and viewers. <laughs> well, several, or I, I, you're probably not alone, Josh, because uh, several organizations involved in the industry of fixing computer devices, including smartphones, submitted petitions to expand exemptions related to the diagnosis, maintenance, repair, and modification of software enabled, dev enabled devices. Previously, the exemption applied only to a category of devices. Most of the items we interact with today, Josh, are software enabled. I mean, sure, there's your phone and your computer, but what about your automated vacuum? And what about your smart washer and dryer? What about your refrigerator and your stove? I mean, even rice cookers I know of are uh, software enabled. And your car today, it's more like a computer than a combustion engine machine that my grandfather drove. Could you imagine where you only had one choice for fixing these devices, either the manufactured licensed facility or no choice at all? I would hate to imagine such a situation, Scott. I know that recently my Samsung television went out and when I went to uh, seek assistance from the licensed repair facility, it had about 500 one-star reviews on Yelp. So I would hate to think that I'm either stuck using that company service or I have to do it myself, which is probably going to have the same effect as having the one-star company do the repair. Well, fear not. The registrar approved the uh, 
the expansion to cover the diagnosis, maintenance, and repair of all software-enabled de enabled devices. Now, it did not allow uh, for the modification of devices. It did not allow that exemption. The registrar agreed that the diagnosis, maintenance, and repair of software-enabled devices are likely to be fair use, where the purpose is to restore device functionality, and that when properly applied, the fair use factors, together with the existing case law, should ensure that consumers, repair technicians, and others interested in repairing their broken devices uh, will be able to engage in most traditional repair activities without fear of copyright infringement liability. Why did the registrar reject modification? So interestingly enough, um, the opposition to the inclusion of modification was pretty fierce. The opponents said that the modification as applied to a broad class of goods was just too vague. The modification could have a different meaning depending upon the device. And the opponents cautioned that some modifications could implicate a software owner's derivative work rights. Others argued that modification of software on devices that protect access to expressive content, even for benign reasons, could comprise or compromise, sorry, digital ecosystem protections, leading to unauthorized access and piracy. In the end, the registrar found that it really could not conclude that modification generally constitutes a non-infringing use. How does this tie into the broader right to repair movement? The right to repair movement seemed to gain some huge momentum during the early days of the pandemic. You may recall news reports of tech companies pivoting from their general business to starting to repair ventilators. Now, repairing medical devices and other sophisticated software-enabled devices is not really possible without access to technical manuals and repair documentation. And those usually aren't readily available, and they're usually very closely guarded by the device manufacturer. During the early days of COVID, medical device manufacturers, including GE, came under immense political pressure. And they released, they ended up releasing critical repair documentation for devices that were deemed to be essential to the diagnosis and treatment of COVID. Now, Europe is already pressing for broad right to repair legislation. And in July of this year, President Biden directed the Federal Trade Commission to come up with rules that will stop manufacturers from limiting consumers' ability to repair products at independent shops. That's really interesting, Scott. We'll have to keep an eye on this. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for tuning in to this installment of The Briefing by the IP Law Blog. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're interested in additional content, visit our website at theiplawblog.com. Thank you.